Thank you very much for the reading us here. Uh, it's uh, it's really great uh, to see uh, to come in person and actually talk talk uh, to everyone how they feeling how they actually working from a style like last two years we've been pretty much hold up at home and uh, doing all of our work, which was a different uh, you know compared to whatever I was doing for almost two decades. So uh, it changed everything, uh, specifically the way how we operate operate. Operation is a, is a one of the key word, right? So today I am uh, going to talk about API lifecycle and security. Uh, it's, it's mostly I'm going to figure out, like going to talk about how uh, an operator and a developer would balance when they operate uh, API management system within a given enterprise. <coughs> to start with, uh, I am Rajesh Bhavanandam. I'm a director of product management for Nginx. It's a part of uh, FI. So Nginx, I'm sure I'm not going to ask anyone, are you using Nginx? I'm not going to ask anyone to raise hands because I know you are using Nginx. And we thought without knowing it. Nginx is, uh, is a very inevitable piece of an infrastructure. People actually use it without even knowing. Sometimes it could be an uh, open source or it could be sometimes it could be an uh, enterprise edition of it. Regardless, we create that on a mind by you know, uh, going to be <clears throat> very important piece of uh, infrastructure uh, product for an uh, infrastructure piece. If I have to uh, explain Nginx in a very simple term, I used to term this more of a Lego block. Nginx is more of a Lego block. What that means, you can actually construct it however you want it to. Nginx can do multiple uh, uh, use cases. One, you can actually use Nginx as a web server. Nginx can be actually constructed to use it as a load balancer. At the same time, it can be used as to actually work as an API gateway as well. A lot of people actually didn't know that it actually be a, one of the powerful API gateway in the market. If you if you pick any of the API gateway in the market currently using, most of them are using uh, Nginx as its base and they have written something on top of uh, the Nginx. So the API gateway, what we provide, it doesn't have any bloatware. It is, it's a raw and it is faster in a way how it operates. So this one is pretty pretty uh, closer to my heart. Uh, so as I, as I mentioned, you can actually convert the Lego into any of the superhero. It could be a web server, as I mentioned, it could be a, a API gateway or it could be a load balancer. It doesn't stop there. You can run Nginx within a Kubernetes environment as well. I'm pretty sure whoever using Kubernetes or using, without, without, again, with or without knowing, Kubernetes ingress controller, which is based on Nginx, which is, which is a, uh, an open source uh, edition of Nginx. So, so now coming to the point of actually what DevOps actually, DevOps plays a, plays a role in this one. Where we were going through uh, surveys, one thing it was very, very clear that for last at least two to three years of a survey I've been noticing, almost 75 to 76 percent of the people are actually waiting to run, uh, waiting for the pipeline to complete successfully. That's the most of the time the, developer, the DevOps people are actually spending time with. The 74 percent of the people, 70, 75 percent of the time, are actually waiting for the build test setup to be completed. So most of, if you look at it, if you're given eight hours, almost 75% of the time is spent on waiting for certain things to happen. The ops people are looking for a product which actually figure out how we can actually cut down the timing, how we can be more productive uh, in, a, in a given uh, environment. The digital transformation, I mean, I'm kind of shy to use this word anymore. Digital transformation is just like a more of a legacy word these days, but still I'm gonna uh, present it because a lot of us still go through this transformation. This transformation actually created a lot of complexity in an enterprises. A lot of enterprises went through two, like a, like a two-legged horses where they went one as a legacy uh, uh, infrastructure where they have the IT running and they also at the same time parallel, on parallel they created a digital team that they want to go faster on, the, on their product, whatever they're creating. Almost 80% of the uh, customers are operating at least minimum of two to three or different architecture. It could be a multi-cloud or it could be a single cloud, regardless of, because the way how the teams are structured, there are at least um, uh, two, two to three architectures being deployed in a given enterprises. 70% of the enterprises are building mostly to, uh, to, for the inter, internal APIs. The APIs are, you can classify probably in two to three terms. One is internal or external, like a public API or a partner API. 70% of the uh, enterprises are actually building the APIs purely for an internal consumption. And 
41%, we have noticed that the security incident has been quick, it keep increasing. It's not a 41%. As we talk, it's keep increasing. The number of uh, uh, you know, attack and security breaches happening on the APS is really growing fast. From a DevOps point of view, there are three pillars if I have to actually highlight. Complexity, or the visibility, and the threat. I actually wanted to put a, um, a roundabout, a complex roundabout for the complexity thing. Then I realized that except Australians, no one understands the roundabouts. When I went to uh, US, they do not understand roundabouts. So what is what, what do they do with that one? And I realized that there was not many roundabouts back there. So I have to flip to this one. I hope this looks image like a, a complexity here. So uh, they have to tackle this level of a complexity because the enterprise is growing faster in probably in a two-pace uh, mode. And most importantly, they need to be productive and a time to market is much more essential more than any, any time. The other one is visibility. Since the product, uh, since the uh, the enterprises actually have such a uh, vast, uh, such a vast expansion on their uh, development, they may need to make sure that who is actually operating and where it is operated. They need a unified view of a high level view of what's happening on a given enterprise, and threats. The since the digital transformation started to happen, the threat is becoming much more larger and larger, and. Most of the time when we expose APIs, we did not think about a lot of uh, the security aspect when we expose an API. So the threats actually, as I mentioned, it is increasing like you know, uh, in a multiple fold every year, every month, and every day. So when we actually went back, we already had an API management system in place. Uh, probably last 12 to 18 months, what we went, but we went back to the whiteboard, we realized that there are two different personas we need to actually tackle when it comes to API solution. One is, the uh, developers are the one who actually create services and try to expose that as an API. The other set of persona is the operators who actually operate on scale, how they can actually serve the developers to make sure that those data planes, the API gateways are in place so that the developers can actually go and build their services and expose it. Most importantly, what has happened in due to the digital transformation is uh, a lot of decentralization happened. The teams are actually divided into multiple business units and the LOBs. They all have their own way of actually developing, the choice of selecting technology, choice of doing uh, uh, programming languages. So that actually created a lot of uh, complexity for operators. When we actually sat back, when we ba went back to the whiteboard, we realized that we need to make sure that it depends on the culture of the company, culture of how they're operating. You need to make sure that the balance between the operators and developers needs to be rightly given. So it, it's not that opinionated that developers is superior than dev, devs and, sorry, uh, operators are superior than devs and vice versa. So you wanted to make sure that we are actually fitting into the culture what customers actually been operating. Hence, we went back and we created this new product which we launched probably two weeks ago called API Connectivity Manager. So this is an, a management plane which helps you to custom, helps customers, specifically operators and developers to take their services and launch that as an API as, as soon as possible. When we actually went, the, as I mentioned, the problems, what I talked about, the agility, the complexity, as well as the security, those are all the few things which took us a top priority so when we actually trying to uh, solve the problem. This particular uh, diagram is very closer to my heart. This kind of, I stole it from my, one of my mentor. Uh, we took this as a principle when we went and uh, when we went and actually went went for a redesign of this product. So this shows a control tower and a flight. As you can imagine that all the flights when you're trying to take off and land, they need a clear direction. They need a clear help from the control tower so that they can safely land and safely take off without colliding into each other thing. But at the same time, once they take off, they are on their own. They need some help, but they should be able to operate by themselves without any hindrance from from the control tower or from the from the operators. So that is the idea. We kind of took it from here, and we try to apply it in our new platform, where the operators actually gives a flexibility of actually letting the uh, the flight operands to go and operate their services. At the same time, we give we apply a certain level of a guardrails for the developers so that they actually play within a given boundary. So that was the idea behind the this particular product. Just from a high level, I just wanted to jump into a demo, so I'm just trying to rush it. Uh, I have 20 minutes anyway. Uh, from a high level, this is the uh, new uh, API Connectivity Manager deployment model will, uh, model would look like. So that you can actually let uh, your operators to go and configure your data planes, which is Nginx, Nginx Plus or Nginx Open Source as an API gateway 
where you can run uh, API Gateway to secure your services. At the same time, you can also document your um, APIs and put that into your developer portal. So as part of this API Connectivity Manager, it does a two job as a management plane. One is to secure your APIs, secure your APIs via uh, API Gateway, and also it also bring the documentation aspect to the developer portal. I will pause it for a second before I just jump onto the... I would, um, instead of just talking about what API Connectivity Manager is, I thought I'll give a small demo uh, within the next probably 15 minutes so that I can take questions maybe offline. So the API Connectivity Manager, as I said, it is the next version, next breed of an API management solution where it let you to actually manage your lifecycle, API lifecycle, and let you to manage your data planes as well. So as I mentioned, there are two personas we are actually trying to uh, moderate here. One is ops person who actually look after the infrastructure where they look after the lifecycle of the data plane. And we have developers who actually develop services, who develop services and expose the services as an API, which means they manage the lifecycle of APIs. So we pretty much have to balance between two different lifecycle. One is more about the infrastructure lifecycle, the other one is to uh, the lifecycle of the APIs. So as an ops person, as a platform, uh, platform ops or a DevOps person, I go and uh, if I have to create an infrastructure, one of the concepts we brought into uh, the new uh, management plane is called workspaces. This is a, like a logical boundary between, uh, between the teams. So there could be uh, a centralized operation team, there could be a decentralized operation team. It's totally, again, it depends on how every enterprise works. So in this particular case, again, we didn't take any uh, open opinion about it, but we actually gave an uh, option for customers to run in a way how they wanted to. So in this case, they can go and create a number of workspace. Uh, let's say I belong to a platform ops and I create a workspace. So eventually, probably next four to six weeks, you will start to see, uh, you, will be, you will be able to apply or back uh, access control mechanism on top of these workspaces, which means if a team uh, platform ops belongs, uh, there are five or six people belong to a platform ops team, only they can operate, they can actually manage the life cycle of the product compared to the other uh, other workspaces. So think of workspace as a more of a logical boundary within, within Nginx. One other aspect, I, I talked about the time to market uh, part of it. One thing which we were very, very cautious when we developed, redeveloped this product was to make sure that how fast customers can actually go and do things, how fast an operators can go and make sure that the, the, the environment is ready. In this particular example, if you see it, I don't need, I'm, I'm trying to, cre I, I created a workspace, now I need an environment. So I don't need too many things. All I need is um, <clears throat> uh, environment name and the cluster name where it is going to be done and what's the host name for it. So these are all the three uh, information I needed to go and create an environment. I don't need anything else. So the idea behind this is to make sure that we're helping the developers as well as the operators to make sure that they are quickly realizing the value of the product. At the same time, any type of a security things which has actually been taken care by ACM, the uh, API, connectivity man API connectivity manager by itself. So here all I gave was the three uh, information. So here what it does was it went and created an environment. At the same time, it actually emits a curl command. So ideally what happens is operator actually picks up this curl command and go and run this curl command with your data plane. So your data plane could be an Nginx uh, running somewhere. It could be it could be running in AWS. It could be, it could be running in a, in a Kubernetes environment or even in a GCP environment. It really doesn't matter. So wherever you run your Nginx uh, as a data plane for, from an API gateway perspective, all you have to do is you have to copy this curl command and register that Nginx Plus as a data plane back to this ACM. So here the ACM act as a mothership. All the data planes tend to actually get registered back here into this cluster. So this gives a, a, a way for any uh, operators to go and keep adding more and more data planes to that one. So you can horizontally scale, it depends on how you wanted to do it, depends on your throughput, or it could be depends on your, uh, uh, any of other aspects, you can keep adding data planes uh, horizontally to the cluster. I have already done that, but I'm not going to actually register it. So all I'm going to do is I'm just created the cluster now. It's uh, assumed that I have actually went and ran the curl command and it got registered to this one. So you can start to see that the cluster is created and you can actually also see that the, the instance is already online. So you can keep adding uh, a number of uh, data planes to this particular cluster. One thing, if you'd notice it, we only gave three information at the time of creating this, this particular environment. But ACM behind the scene, what it did was, it went and actually applied a certain level of a global policies. This is 
little opinionated, but at the same time, this is not forced upon the operators. Operators can go and still go and change it. If they don't like it, they can completely go and change the global policies up to their own uh, need. So I'll, give, I'll, I'll show you an example. So all I did was, all I created was an environment and it just went and registered the data plane and when I'm trying to actually, actually access the particular environment with an API call, it actually gave back a response like it is not found. So that's an, a, 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 a valid response. The part of it, you can see that there are some of the headers which actually came out. None of this actually been configured by myself. Our operators don't have to do this one. This is again an opinionated uh, uh, a policy which was applied at the part of creation. So you can go and change this anytime, but this is again some of the security headers which is most needed for any of this API responses as part of part of any APIs. And this response, how whether this is a JSON payload or anything, you can actually go and define as part of the global policy. So which is which is again part of this uh, you know the environment creation. So all of this is quite 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 easily you can change it. Uh, just to give an example, you can see that the server is actually here. It says that it's uh, with its version. Some of the uh, enterprises doesn't like exposing the version, what API gateway version they are running. So you can pretty much go into this and uh, enable the policy. You can actually go and hide the Nginx headers always and you can publish it immediately. The moment when you go and publish the policy, it will immediately, it will get effect in all the data planes that get configured to this one. So if I go back and try to make the same call, so you won't see the version anymore. So similar to this one, you can actually configure all the policies, whatever I applied at the global level. So again, if I have to step back the previous statements which I made, as an operator, I'm trying to impose a certain level of a global policies to all the APIs that's going to belong to this environment. As a developer, they will, not, they will have no say on that one. So this actually gives a way where we can provide a certain level of a streamlined approach to all the APIs that belongs to that particular environment. So I'll just quickly show you uh, the number of policies that is uh, uh, available. If anyone have used Nginx, probably you would have more familiar with its directives. So here what has happened is with the API Connectivity Manager, we have abstracted it and made sure that it is more open and made, made sure that you are able to actually work with from a policy perspective as a, as a plugin. So you can disable and enable without learning uh, the Nginx directive. If you are thorough with Nginx directive, there are other ways to go and do it, but this is more of an abstraction model to actually make sure that you are able to understand from a conceptual perspective, from a, like a security policy or a logging policy from that point of view. Uh, I, I will actually showcase the OpenID Connect uh, relying parties, but you can see that there are other security policies like a TLS, mutual TLS. TLS is part of it, but you can go and enable mutual TLS as a policy uh, uh, from a global point of view. So these are all maintained by the operators. The developers doesn't have to worry about all of this. So they create the environment and the environment is ready now. It's the same for the listeners as well. So you can go and create any number of listeners. So we are planning to introduce more and more uh, protocols. Probably you'll start to see gRPCs and HTTP2, uh, eventually HTTP3. But for now, we will have only HTTP and uh, you can enable that with mutual TLS. So now as a as an operator, I have created an environment. Now I'm actually handing over that to uh, a developer. So as a developer, I may belong to a different BUs, different LOBs. So in this particular case, let's say I belong to a payment team. I may own tons of APIs, and there could be another team which, uh, uh, which there could be another workspace where it can host a different set of APIs where you don't have to actually you know step onto each other toes. So that could be uh, Mike. Mike might have a uh, you know a, a team a LOB which is working on invoice APIs. There could be ten, tens of twenties of APIs that belong to that workspace, and I may own a different set of APIs. So in this particular case, when I have to go to market, when I have to release an API, when I have my services ready, I don't have to actually you know work with the other set of the team to uh, to you know to uh, to make sure that we are not actually crossing the borders. So we we have clearly separated those concerns here with the workspaces. So here it, you should be able to quite easily deploy your APIs without without stepping onto each other toes. So now we have created a, a workspace for the developer. So now let's actually go and create a quick hello world service. I will not go with open API spec for the first one. I'll just go with just a simple one. Uh, all I have to give is uh, hello world and I'll version it. All I do is publish. 
this is a similar approach what you saw with uh, the operator persona. So what's the uh, you know minimum information you needed to onboard an API is the steps we have taken. All you needed is a backend where I need to route and how I need to be accessing this API. These are all the high level information you needed. So as part of it, we went there and you can see that this is actually, this API is already uh, done. There is no there is no advanced route as part of it. All we are saying that is, if it is hello world, just route everything to this particular uh, backend. So you can add multiple backend to it. We also have a policy concept uh, part of this API proxy. The API, as I mentioned, we have global policies which is imposed by the operators. And as a developer, I only have a say to go and enable this set of a policies. So in this particular case, I can actually go and choose any of this policy. So I have rate limiting, I have proxy caching. I, this is one of the popular uh, friend for uh, Nginx. So it is one of the you know highest demand uh, people actually look for. This is you know Nginx is pretty popular doing the the caching part of uh, the side. There are other security policies as well, like API key, basic auth. As I, I, I personally, I would not recommend it to use those policies, um, but there are certain cases where customers still rely on those uh, set of uh, security use cases. But for now, just for a quick uh, demo, I will go and uh, do a JOT-based uh, uh, web assertion. I have an Okta uh, already running, um, so I'll take this. All I need to create um, a JOT policy is to just the endpoint for the keys. Some of you might know that for the OpenID Connect, you need a, a, a JOT based one. You need a public key search where it's hosted by your IDPs. It could be any any IDP. It could be a Okta, it could be Auth0, or it could be Azure AD. Our product is not tied to any of those IDP. If you have following the right level of a standards, all you need is this particular endpoint, which says what is the third key of, for this one. And you just go and add and uh, publish it. I should not be able to access uh, the API because it has been hosted by this one. So let's jump onto it. And so I'm trying to uh, make an API call uh, to my Okta environment where I wanted to you know, access a token. So got a JOT token back, and I will try to pass that as part of my uh, request to access the API gateway. So what happens behind the scene now when I pass this particular request, the request get passed and Nginx is configured to assert the JOT token, and the JOT token will be you know, uh, retrieved from the request and it automatically makes a call to Okta and get the public key and cache it for a certain period of time. That is highly configurable as well. And then every time when the request is uh, coming for this particular IDP, it will automatically actually assert the token to make sure that the, the token is not tampered and it is not also expired as part of it. So just by hitting it, oh, what did I do? You know, uh, back in India, we actually have a lot of gods for everything. For if, even if you have to write an exam, <laughs> If you have to write an exam, there is a God for it. Everything, we need a God, hundreds of God. Uh, I've been here, living here for the last 20 years. Almost I, I lost that uh, tradition. But lately I found uh, a God, a demo God or demigod. Uh, <laughs> our own Thor, looked like Thor didn't actually help me today. So that actually, uh, you know, it actually, Nginx actually catches that uh, public key and it automatically verifies it. If, it. if I send another set of token, it will automatically make sure that it is not tampered and at the same time it is secured behind behind the Nginx Plus. So there are, there are other policies. I won't go f uh, too much further uh, into it, but I wanted to show you one other thing from an ops perspective. We, we, we looked into the API gateway cluster creation, how easy it was. It is the same concept for a developer portal as well. If you may have hundreds of API. It could be an internal API or it could be a public facing API. So as part of this one, all you have to do is, it's a similar concept. All you have to do is go back uh, and create um, all you need to create a developer post portal cluster is the cluster name and the host name. So once you create the developer portal host name, you, it's the same ritual. You copy paste this curl command and go back to your developer portal Nginx Plus and your Nginx Plus will register that as a, like a developer portal. If you remember I mentioned Nginx is more of a, a Lego block. You can construct it in however you want it to. In this particular case, in first case, I constructed that as an API gateway. In this particular case, I'm constructing as a, a developer portal, like more of a, a web content survey. So here, once that is actually done, you go back and have a look into the developer portal. You can see that it is very highly configurable. You can go and white label your APIs, sorry, white label your developer portal. So 
all we all I gave was just a two information. All it 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 went and actually created a, a developer portal with a, with a default theme on it. It is it's a default theme. You can go and completely change this look and feel of it and make sure that it actually resonate with your uh, look and feel of your company. Whatever you have, the logos, colors, fonts, everything is uh, highly configurable. And also uh, the policies let you to go and. Um, the policy here it will let you to go and create open id connect policy so here you can go and enable the open id connect policy automatically it will enable the single sign on for your for your enterprise organization so you don't have to do anything apart from that so i think that's the end of the presentation i hope it lives up to the par uh, if you guys need any more uh, questions please reach me out i'll be around thank you <laughs>